Great. Um, congratulations on the movie. Thank you. I absolutely loved it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And one of the funny things for me was like, you know, I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s in a small suburb of Massachusetts, right? Right. right. NWA was as important for me and my friends growing up as it was for kids in South Central. So you were fans. That's yeah. how big a scope their music had. Yeah. You're a young guy. What was your knowledge and history of NWA going into this film? Well... I was born right around the time they were making the album. Right. So, you know, I wasn't, uh, <laughs> I wasn't around, but like you said, you know, I, I, I mean, I grew up in D.C., the D.C. area, DMV, and um, it, it was the same, the same sort of story, the same things they talked about, the same, you know, implications with the police and the, the all those situations. Sorry. No, it's um, fine. <laughs> The same, you know, controversy, the same political, social, economic climate, all of that stuff, where this, it, it's the same in city to city, no matter where you go, especially in America. But I, but I grew up listening to it. I mean, how could you not? The album is amazing. To this day, it's incredible what they were able to do. And it's funny because, you know, I say my mom, my mother's a police officer, but, you know, we had the vinyls at the house, you know, because we were fans of music in general. And I'm an old head, so I, mean, I used to li I listened to a lot of like old Motown and classic stuff. So we had the record player and the vinyls and all of that great stuff. But yeah, man, I was a fan from day one. You know? Well, when you get an iconic role like this, I mean, Dr. Right. Dre is one of the greatest, whatever you want to call him, rapper, producer. Every title you could be. Yeah, pretty much, right? Is it a daunting task to have to play him as opposed to playing, you know, a uh, fictional character that you're creating? Was, did you feel a responsibility? It's just different. Yeah. It's, it's different. And absolutely, I felt the responsibility. When I initially heard the call about <clears throat> get, about the movie, um, you know, the casting had been going on for so long. And finally, my agent called and said, you know, we have an appointment, you know, for casting. And I said, I can't do this. I, I, I really can't. I don't think I'm the guy for the job because... I don't want to be the one to mess this story up. And it's, it, it was around the time that the huge, you know, deal with Apple and Beats was was going through. And, you know, he was in the media a lot and people were talking about him. And I was like, this is a little too much for me. So I don't know why. He, he scheduled the appointment and uh, called me back 8 o'clock that night and said, where were you, man? Why didn't you go in? And I said, I told you I was not, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't do this. Like, I literally, that's how much... I had, I, you know, it was sort of my insecurities as an actor, as all of us, you know, who are in this business have from time to time. And then one thing led to another. I ended up Skyping with Gary at the office, at the casting office. And shout out to Cindy Tolan and Vicky Thomas for casting this film because it's excellent. But one thing led to another. I ended up meeting Dre. And when he said, when you get the stamp of approval from the man himself, I mean, it's just like weight off your shoulders. And then another weight comes on your shoulders when you realize you got a lot of work to do. Now you, you got to do it. You actually got to, you know, step up to the plate and bring it. But he gave me everything I needed. Um, you know, I, I had access to his family, to his wife, to his friends, to, you know, Cube, to everybody. And, and any time I need, he was on set every single day. And when he wasn't on set, he was in the studio. When he wasn't in the studio, he was at the office when, you know, or with, with the family. But it was, it was always laser focused on the humanity and getting it, just trying to get it right. And and it was about the pull, push and pull because it's not a showy role, it's not a, a flashy role. It's about the little details and the little nuances and, and knowing when to go. And when you do let loose, you let loose. You know, when, when all that pent up aggression and all that pent up frustration at death row was happening and he wanted to change his life, he did. And it came out in a, in a, in a, in a powerful way, but yeah, from day one, it was it was a lot. But Gary gave me everything I needed to do. One of the scenes that um, the audience that I saw the film with went crazy for mm -hmm. is the first time Snoop Dogg is introduced. <laughs> and, you, and Keith Stanfield's incredible. Keith is amazing, man. And, That's and, my boy. And there was, when he first appears on screen, before he says a word, there's sort of a hush over the audience, kind of like, is that who we think it's going to be? <laughs> and then wild, as soon as he man. opens his mouth, I mean, the, it a roar, <laughs> a roar erupted in the audio, I'm clapping, yeah. like it just went crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's an iconic character he's portraying. Tell me about the first day on set when he opened his mouth. What was the reaction to the crew and the cast on set? Listen, Keith is an unbelievable actor, you know? 
um, and he's the he's the kind of actor that I, I I like to work with. You know, he's he's up there, man. He brings his A game to whatever the role is. And I remember when he came in and 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 you know Snoop, S N O double, you know, what I'm like I'm just like, oh, this is Snoop, man. And and I it took me out of it for a minute. I'm like, okay, I gotta remember. You got, we gotta lock back in the pocket here, but. Um, that day, man, he just he, he 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 effortlessly sort of channels, you know, those Snoopisms. You know what I mean? That that sort of that sort of effortless cool that Snoop has. You know that rawness that Snoop has, and it's only for a brief period in the film, but he but he hit it. You know? He oh, it's a it. very small part in the movie. Yeah. You know, over in the course of the movie, it's a very small. I mean, it's maybe two scenes. Yeah, yeah. But it, he lost it. it. It's so important he to locked. have that. Just Absolutely, right. because you you know you can, it's it's a, it's a huge story. The story in W W A the family tree is just and it could easily become comedic, right? If it was cast wrong or the exactly. right, and exactly, and it could easily turn into you know a caricature, impersonation, yep. or a mimic, you know, and that's especially you know when talking to Dre, like it was just like we don't want to do that, right? You know, we could easily find somebody who is identical to Snoop, who you know sounds exactly like him. Right. But we trying to find, we trying to dig a little deeper, you know. Well, I also want to ask you about the Tupac scene, right? Because obviously that the got a reaction on the audience as well. Was that always in the script from day one when you got on, or was that something that was sort of added maybe later? We realized I, we needed. It, he's important to the story, right. even in a minor role. We need to just honor him with a scene. I think that always, like Pac was always, especially for Dre. You know, it was always important. That we find a way to 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 get Pac's story in some way, you know, just to just to have him around, you know, <clears throat> and I think another film could and should be dedicated to that because you could just go on. Oh, I mean, yeah. this film could be nine, ten hours, and I think there was a version that it was nine or ten hours, but that was actually we came back to the drawing board and. We were like, we, we just have to do it. And I remember, you know, talking to Gary and, and talking to Dre and Keaton and everybody was like, this is this is it. And so we ended up coming back and shooting it, doing some additional photography. That day was amazing, man. Mark showed up on set, who plays Pac in the film, and he was just Tupac. Everybody got chills. When he would walk through the halls, you felt it. You felt like Pac was here with us. The other crazy thing about that, man, I mean, we had Gary on set, Dre, you know, everybody was there. John Singleton was there. Um, everybody just wanted to see it be right, you know? And it happened to be Tupac's birthday. That that was, that, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it just the timing and everything. It wasn't planned because it was schedule based. Like, I had to fly back out to, you know, to do it. And it just happened to land on Tupac's birthday that we were doing this. And, Man, it was just electric in the room, and then as soon as we heard Cal California, I mean, it was just, it was powerful. Wow. It was powerful. Yeah, it's an amazing scene. It comes in a, at a great part in the film, part right. in the film, too, where right. it's very pivotal. Well, I wanted to ask you, because you kind of touched on it, the movie is clearly a biopic of the history of the NWA, the history of NWA. Uh, at the same time, it's also a film about, really, the history of L.A., in the 80s and 90s and right. the transition it went through and it's also a film about the history of west coast rap exactly right and so exactly. so you've got a movie now exactly. where it really is keying in on these three different themes can right. you talk a little bit about that it's keying in on like you said those three themes and and it's and and a few other themes too without and we tried without you know making it a lesson you mm -hmm. know <clears throat> la and compton is as much a character in this film as I think any of the members of NWA and they and they came out and supported us we shot in Compton a lot and it could easily have been you know a lot of negative energy a lot of you know people sort of doubting and and you know but from day one they were out there on the rooftops sleeping on the rooftops with the sleeping bags just trying to catch a glimpse walking through the streets Dre easy you know like Q what's up Red, yellow, and and everybody just they wanted it to be right just as much as we wanted it to be right, and they were there. I mean, I remember when we shot the Detroit scene; it just it it three thousand thirty five hundred extras just sort of filling up an arena and and just going for it and just having a a great time reliving this music and reliving their message because a lot of the stuff that they talked about then is still relevant now. So a lot of the people who showed up 
and and came out are still experiencing the things. It don't matter. It doesn't matter the age. I'm 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 26 years old, but I still experience the same frustrations that they experienced and. It's all about giving voice to it and, and having that dialogue. Well, let me ask you about that because obviously the film is coming out at, at a point in time where we've experienced things in Ferguson right. and right. Atlanta and Baltimore and right. you know issues that the film deals with in a context of 20 years ago right. are still relevant, relevant today. Right. Um, it's sort of a perfect storm that the movie would be coming out at that time. Obviously, that's not planned, but could you talk a little bit about the importance of it in that way? Well... It is, it's sort of hard to say, you know, there couldn't be a better time because it's a sad situation, right. but I just, you know, the, the sort of, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not laughable, but it's just a shame that these same, this is the, these are the same things that they have been talking about since they made this album. They they set out to you know they set out to be hood stars. They just wanted to have fun. They were young guys. They said things that a lot of people didn't like, and and that's cool too because they were human, you know. And 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 they made mistakes and and everything. But they but when they touched when they t touched on the police brutality and political corruption and and all of those things, that's when ears and and red flags started going up because it wasn't just central to Compton anymore. Your message is spreading to other, you know, there's white kids at Ivy League colleges listening to this music. Uh-oh, now it's a problem. We thought it was just in the hood, but now it's, a, now it's becoming a problem because our, our, our children are hearing this. And, and that's, that's a shame in a way because <laughs> we should be able to experience and, and, and embrace all forms of, of, of culture and be able to step up and, and say something about it. And that's what they did. And they put their foot on the gas you see it in the film, it's like, no, we, we're not gonna back away from this. We're gonna hit it head on. And then when Rodney King happened, I mean, it was like, there it is. But did anything change? No. I just, love that that was a backdrop of the film too, is right. the, the, the LA story. That's the climate that they were living in. It was tough times. And I remember when we were shooting the, uh, I think they shut down, I'm not super familiar with it, you know, LA, but we were shooting Laurel Canyon Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And it was the LA riots and sort of the montage of, of everything that was going on and seeing through their eyes them seeing, you know, the, the, what was going on. And that was sad too because I think at the same time I remember going home, turning on the TV and watching what was going on in Ferguson. And I got chills. I was just like, you know, it's, it's yeah. sad. Yeah. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about the, um, one of the final moments in the film where uh, Dre basically tells Suge Knight. I'm leaving. Right. I'm leaving Death Row and start Aftermath. Uh, you know, it's interesting because ta my takeaway from watching that scene and, and the whole movie and how the, the guys deal with Jerry, mm -hmm. Jerry and Suge, and to a certain degree with Jerry Easy, it seemed like they didn't quite understand <clears throat> while they ran the business right. and understood the business right. and could get the records pressed and to the, rec to the radio stations right. and, and yeah, on tour and all that. They didn't understand that they didn't possess the talent, right. that they didn't possess what Dre especially, mm -hmm. Cube with his rhymes mm -hmm. and everything else he's done, and you know, to a certain degree didn't understand that without them, they don't have anything. Well, I don't know if they didn't understand it. I mean, I think they definitely, you know, realized the importance of, of what they brought to the table. I just think, you know, there were things that were, it was just a lot going on that became you know, other than the art, you know? Right. And and a lot of it had to do with the, you know, it was a tough time, I remember talking to Dre about it, you know, people were dying around him every single day. Literally, that, it, it was just becoming a, a sort of, it was it was a intense time. And, 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 and Dre really wanted that to just kind of hit home. But, but the film, I don't think it villainizes them. No. I don't think I mean, it, it should to some degree, but to, I mean, probably to, deserves it. You know, I mean, I, would, I, I don't know. I just, it doesn't villain. I don't feel it villainized Jerry, though. Right. N I not mean, totally. Right. I just, I think More it just, cause, because Suge was the one who created that opportunity for, for Death Row to happen. And right. so, but Dre took, it, it takes a lot for a man. And you see it with Q when he leaves NWA and you see it with Dre later when he realizes everything that was going on and when he, when he has to experience the same thing and leave death row and say, keep it all. I don't want right. any of it. Well, I guess my question was, did you feel in that moment as Dre mm -hmm. that that was sort of what he felt that, take it all, I don't care. I know that I have this, right. I can do it again. Right. 
I don't need what I did with you. That's the past. That's I'll the move thing. on. Like he had that confidence that's in right. himself. That's it. That's it. It was so confidence. You, so he did, and you real, and that's what you were having in that scene. And that, that in that moment, it was it was a sort of, um, you know, it, and then he also realized that it, in order to continue to make the do what he was doing and, and make it necessary for him to do what he was doing, he had to change his situation, and that I think is the that is a. And that confidence in being able to have a voice and change a situation. I think that's an overarching theme. You know, you can talk about all the bad things that these guys said and did, but ultimately you look at what they created mm -hmm. with their with their lives and what they did. It's about changing the situation. And I love that it's sort of art imitates life because that's sort of, you know, with me, Jason, Shay, uh, Aldis, and, and Neil, you know, it's it, we're these young guys who are sort of stepping into the huge shoes and trying to change the situation as well. But it's fun too, you know. It's a it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of heart. You laugh, you cry, and you just you just you go along for the ride. And I think I think it's gonna. I hope it, it touches um, a lot of people's hearts and minds, man. It makes them think. Well, it touched me. I mean, it's it's a brilliant film, brilliant performance. I mean, you guys, Thank you, you, you nailed it. You did it honorably. You did it right. And, Thank you so much. You should feel really proud of yourself. Great talking. Great interview. Appreciate it.